It's July the 30th, 2022, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. And we're all back. All three of us. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Jeremiah. How are you guys doing? Good morning. Very morning. well, thank you. Yes, good stuff. Good morning, That's afternoon. Ah, it's summer. It's summer. People are making pizzas in the wooden oven and stuff like that. We'll be soon. <laughs> right after ah, the call. So let's see. We have um, the three of us. Two, two out of the three of us have a new toy to play with. Um, last time I talked with uh, Jeremiah about Dali, and then I think a couple of days later he got access. So, are you having fun? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm so deep in the rabbit hole, it's not even a hole anymore. It's it's a, a maze of tunnels uh, <laughs> of which I'm completely lost in. But uh, as I said last week, I do believe that the poets of today will be the visual artists of yep. tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> That's kind of, it is without question a new medium of creation. That That's and not the only one. Ooh. And not the only one. Not we the only are. One. We're going to have at least five competing uh, ones very soon. So there's 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 a, a, a huge amount of development in that whole area. Um, we have not seen the last of that for sure. No, we're we're in baby st- we are in baby steps uh, in terms of AI development of visual from text, uh, but it is like using a brush or a chisel um, or, or any medium that one uh, wants to kind of uh, make sure one dominates. You have to look at the material and an easier way in. So there's a certain yeah. amount of surprise. There is a certain amount of, kind of fortitude and tension and uh, editing, which is another aspect. But um uh, mastering it <laughs> will probably take a computer. It, it, does feel, it does feel that some of these things have been produced with a sledgehammer rather than a scalpel. Oh, we are <laughs> a in wrecking early, ball. This is early days at this point, and um, there's a lot of learning going on, and some of that is still more an art than a science. So, at least for yeah, the user. Which brings yeah. us, by the way, to today's topic. Which that was is, why I brought it up. What a segue. You know, <laughs> sorting out an intention to make an image. Uh, or the randomness of it and uh, what happens in between as well. Uh, so I, I, I thought, you know, based on um, our, our kind of photographic kind of uh, precepts and, and, and our photographic intentions and what we love about it is, uh, and, and, you know, I think all of us have gone out, um, you know, for a walk, uh, for a photo walk, um, with the intention of making a specific kind of image, which is, let's say, a landscape with dramatic sky, a simplistic, minimalist, wide image, a 3D image, um, which kind of focuses the eye on foreground, a 3D image that focuses the eye on the background. Whatever our intention is, we go out with our camera cameras to achieve that. And then there is the walking around with a camera or even with our iPhone with no apparent big slung over the shoulder camera and grab things that are random, uh, things that inspire us, uh, things that catch our eye. That could end up to be a beautiful image or an interesting image or a fascinating image. Um, Or just a bland image which taken into the computer and edited becomes something really um, fantastic. Uh, on the other hand, and we've talked about this before, we bury it in our kind of Lightroom or whatever, you know, whatever kind of management. Uh, I photo, I cloud use. photo library. Yeah, wh- wh- well, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and then maybe two, three, four years later in going through it, you identify an image which may not have struck your fancy years before, but all of a sudden that is like a photo walk. You go, oh, look at this. And now with my incredibly dynamic sense of, of, uh, uh, of technical prowess that I have achieved over the pandemic, <laughs> I can take <laughs> this image and I can completely transform it into something that I think is great so that there is the archive 
exploration. There is the in real life exploration. Um, and, and these are things that both the randomness and the intention of photography really, um, I think they come together in the kind of whatever we call the decisive moment, that moment we press the shutter. And that is when we get into the flow and our sense of expectation becomes heightened. Um, and, you know, what, you know a, a, a great cinematographer, Alan Davio, who I, I've worked with many years, I think he's passed, and, and, and he used to say the dailies, but it's the same thing with a, a photograph. He said uh, film dailies are, they all seem good, but no, no first cut, no first assembly of, of a film is as good as the dailies or as bad as the first assembly. <laughs> and I, I, I do believe that, is that you, you know, when you are kind of creating the raw material, the, the sense of uh, expectation, intention is really up there, exciting. When you kind of put it together, you could be deflated and then have to kind of work at moving it up and through the technical uh, adjustments, issues, uh, subversiveness, what, what, however you play to achieve something even greater than your original image. And so please discuss. <laughs> here you go. Now, now it's you. Um, I have, I have something here. Um, okay. We're talking about the making versus the taking of a picture pretty much. Um, so I have a question to both of you. How often uh, is it that you go out to take a picture with a clear intention And then it becomes something different when you're there and, uh, and, and try to put it together. That's a good question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm experiencing something new this year as a result of doing things like publishing a zine and stuff like that. So it's, it's a partial answer to your question uh, in the sense that uh, it's, it's not quite directly linked, though. So I'm, t I'm finding myself going out more these days with a view of an output in mind, but not necessarily of a single image. Mm -hmm. Because having gone through that process you know, uh, of producing a zine, my mind is currently thinking in terms of collections of images that form a coherent piece in some way, shape or form. So I spent... 20 minutes, much to the amusement of my sister-in-law last weekend who was visiting, um, 20 minutes taking photographs of a wasp on an apple core mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was convinced that there's a that, 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 that there's some kind of 1950s sci-fi interpretation, you know, a, a, a wasp. <laughs> you, know, the, you know those old 1950s movies where a spider goes by the radioactive research establishment Van. and then starts eating everybody in town? It's called there's, Van. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's... there's, there's There's a there's a photo in there somewhere, right, of a wasp on an apple core that is 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 gets pitched in in that way somewhere into some some kind of collage or melange that I could produce for a two page spread for a zine. So I'm not sure that I'm at the moment going out much with particular photos in mind, but I am going out with a particular thought for a particular output in mind, uh, which is which leads me to to see things in a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. so does, does that i don't know whether that counts as making or taking i think it it's taking in the in the moment it's taking but in the in the background there's some making i guess it's really uh, about the intention you know, i mean for, in, for, uh, yeah, for me not the output but the intention for, for you jeremiah i mean uh you as a as a filmmaker you as a director um i guess there in, in that in that in that role, you probably have very clear intentions of how things should be, and there is a team, and there is like work, and being a lot of planning going into uh, what is going to come out of this. And I guess most of the time, with all the experience you have, you get it close to where you want it. Um, um, but does that reflect onto your photography, or is the photography kind of the um, let's say the, the 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 balance to to the stringent work as a director. Well, that, that's an excellent question, and, and uh, you know the the kind of quick and easy answer is like yes to both, um, because um, you know in in prep, 
you know, I'm prepping a, a, a film te television series. Um, specifically when you are doing a lot of interior work, but, but even in selecting locations or building outside in a location, adding to the location, choosing the time of day to shoot, um, adding rain, adding, you know, sun, high beams. Lots of, lots of control, uh, right? There's lots of control and many people to uh, enable that control. Yeah. Uh, you have months, literally months, to prepare that. And so, you know, uh, pre-visualization is something that I'm uh, in, in television very much, um, you know, a, a major fan of doing a tremendous amount of prep, uh, playing the scenarios and the sequences, um, the way a set will look. We'll talk about an interior set, where I think the light could come from, how the colors work, all, all of those things and what angles I think work best, all in my head. And so when I get to the set, it's really about executing that uh, much the way a, you know, a coach in a sports team would go, here's the playbook, here's what we're going to run. And then, uh, as Mike Tyson said, everyone's a hero until you get in the boxing ring, until you get punched in the face. And then, you know, the plan goes out the window, so you have to improvise. Um, so I'm open to both things. I come in with a clear intention, and yet I continually feel open, very, very open to the accidents of the moment, whether it's a performative aspect, whether if it's just a light that catches a little bit of gleam somewhere that adjusts my composition, whether I look through the camera and go, you know, I had always imagined this wide, but it looks so good compressed and layered. So I'm always open to that. And yet the initial intention always remains in terms of mood tone. Um, so that's a little different. Um, I did uh, do a, a, a film uh, maybe about 10 years ago on uh, nuclear terror, where I absolutely decided I'm not going to prep it. I'm just going to select my locations. I, I watched this go. and I had it in the back of my mind when I asked the question. And I'm going to go I know, for it. I know oh, that yeah. you had a lot of accidents, uh, deliberate accidents in there. Yes. And so that was exciting and, you know, it turned out really, really well. And it, 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 it's, it's basically a different way to go. And it used maybe more of my photographic instincts. And on the last television series that I, I produced, um, something very, very interesting. We had to shut down because of, of COVID for a week. Uh, and when we came back, you know, I, was, I had hired a few other directors to work. One director was working and some of the, the cast uh, went down with COVID. And we were able to shoot around it. And yet at the last three days... There was nothing to shoot, so in comes the executive producer to start shooting another episode, a future episode, where the actors who weren't sick got to participate with no prep. Like, literally no prep, working completely on instinct. Now, of course, I know the characters, I know the sets, I, you know what I mean? So there's all of that. But normally I'm pretty buttoned down. This turned out to be the best episode, in my opinion, of the series. Ah, so interesting. It's very hard to determine the outcome. But and how about, I, your, you know, how about your photography in that context? Again, good question. When I, during the pandemic, um, I had a notion to photograph the Venice canals, which is... You did your walks. Yeah. I did my walks, and I photographed the canals every day, many pictures, different techniques, different cameras, different approaches you know, from, you know, medium format uh, to pinhole. And, and I put a, a tremendous amount of them on Instagram. And, and um, I went with the intention of exploring a very specific area in as many different aesthetics as I could. So while there was intention of subject, the kind of output or the feeling was a combination of, well, I am going to go and shoot this with pinhole, but I don't exactly know where I'm going to shoot it. Sometimes I, I, I know exactly, you know, when you're on a photo walk in a familiar area and you know, you know, I want to photograph the London Bridge with no traffic from the center, very formal, and just wait for that five o'clock in the morning on Sunday, just like rush out, take the picture, and, you know, 
erase whatever you don't want. You know, that's another way of working. Both give me, you know, a, a lot of joy. And yet when I'm in my studio here, sometimes I will go with a very specific intention. For example, I a few years ago, I, I had it in my head to, to do large format uh, work on Binjitan or I think Binichan. It's the Japanese um, charcoal, very, very specific mm -hmm. charcoal they use, which are incredible forms, very black, but have a little sheen on them. Um, and I set this up in, you know, kind of against a white psych with a four by five camera and very intentionally, you know, move the compositions and shot these. So that was a different approach and one that was very in the flow of, I knew what kind of lighting I wanted, I knew the subject, and it was very formal in that way. Both gave me pleasure in terms of shooting. So, um, but it is using a different part of your brain, I would say. That brain do, thing, do you guys, that's a really good, that's a really good point, using a different part of your brain, because that, that, that happens in a lot of forms. The more planning you do, the the the, the less, intent brain intensive or different type of intensive is is the execution chris chris what about you where are you on the spectrum of make yeah. and take so none okay i i usually have an intention and that might be just a mood or a specific photo <laughs> if i if i know the area if i know what i'm what i'm up against and uh i i often well i never really return with what i intended to um <laughs> parts of that will be in there of course um i know I've, i know that i can get the mood that i want I, I have the tech uh sorted but it is very very often that when i'm there that i let myself be influenced of what is there what the light is what the what the mood in the air is you know because that is different depending on the time of day or what you're hearing what you're smelling and so on so i let these things kind of filter down into the into the uh into the into the production that i do and um then i end up with with something possibly very similar but usually slightly different and i think the tools that we now have, the new AI tools that we now have, are really going to help people, uh, creative people, to learn how to be more specific about what they want because they force you to sure. be more specific. So ah. that is a good exercise in pre-visualization because you need to dis you need to be able to uh, to verbally describe what you want. And I didn't, I never had to do this for my photography at least if I didn't work with anyone else. So um, learning to describe what you want, and and, th and that's where Jeremiah has a clear advantage because you work with people on projects, so um, you have to describe what you want. Um, I never really had to do this for my photography, so it was always more of a, yeah, more, more so that, gut that's feeling a really, involved. That's a really interesting point because yeah, uh, you guys have been both playing with Dali and and now learning how to generate output through through the input that you choose. So are you are you suggesting if if I th think you're suggesting, Chris, if I follow you correctly, is that as those sorts of tools mature and the ability to generate more meaningful for, for whatever that means means for individuals more meaningful output then the art of input will be will become a, a creative endeavor uh, uh, and very specific in its own right i mean the, the art of Dali control terms, yeah. the, art, the art of controlling it because um i mean you have to do that with a camera if you want to if you want your intention to be uh, captured in a photo, you need to be able to control the focus and the exposure and the white balance and whatever um, to to get where you want. Uh, if you don't, then the camera will do what it thinks what it thinks is best or what uh, some Japanese engineer thinks is best. <laughs> that's uh, that's so, yeah. Can, can I ask a question then? Because I haven't had a chance to play with this tool yet. But yeah, my understanding of AI is it learns from historical data. So where's you know, do do we end up then in a world where all art is derivative and we could argue the philosophy of that statement no. to the cows come home but but you know how is it that you would use ai type tools to generate genuinely new things when ai 
you know, is primarily trained on existing historical data. Well, it's not taking historical things and, and makes a collage out of them and makes that look like a photo. That's not how it works. It creates something new every time you ask it to. Um, and it has seen 650 million pictures. It has digested 650 million pictures and it's digesting more every day. So it has very obviously seen more than you have. So the question is, can you do something brand new that has not been there? Is it possible to do something that no one else has even thought about before? So, so I would argue no. <laughs> rightly or wrongly, I, I would... I'm thinking now of impressionist painters, right? And the impact that they made uh, on on the art world at the uh, uh, in their time, and nobody had ever painted. And and you could possibly pick other examples, but uh, you know, I'm imagining now people like. Um, Manet out in the field trying to capture the purple cut, a purple and grey of the sky, even though everybody knows in their heart of hearts that the sky is blue. He's painting it purple and grey, and 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 he's doing it very quickly because he's trying to capture an image. Yeah, you know, that. How, how do you generate that kind of newness? I, you know, uh, I I could say that first of all, there's an argument to say that all art is appropriated and derivative. Uh, there, there's no art that comes out of kind of a vacuum. It all comes as a flow. I mean, Seurat, great example, right? Painting and point list. Nobody had done that before. And yet, when he did that, there was a whole outrage of, you know, how could he do this? This is dust, is ridiculous. He was criticized. And yet, on the other side, it was like, this is genius. This is amazing. Um, Manet is a great example because Manet was, I mean, forget about the colors for, for a moment, but Manet was an amazing draftsman. He, he was one of the great draftsmen in terms of painting at the time, could do ultra-realistic perspectives, etc. But when he began to paint and really kind of get through the kind of technical achievements, it just were he started to play with perspective sizes, really transforming it, and not even in obvious ways, just compressing the backgrounds and making figures bigger or smaller. And he was widely um, criticized for that, and yet it was under his control because many didn't know that he was a master draftsman. So is, sometimes our techniques come out of an antithesis of existing techniques or existing aesthetics that we want to go like, you know, in music, you know, the whole, uh, you know, punk came out of a reaction to overproduced or, you know, the, the Seattle movement uh, comes out of just a rawness that was a counterbalance to, you know, like, you know, uh, mixing with like 200 channels and harmonies, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and so it's not to criticize one over the next, it's the act, you know, the, the reaction in a Hegelian way, you know, the synthesis, antithesis, and, and um, that kind of keeps things moving forward. Uh, you know, one could also say that no photograph or work is exactly as one intended. It's usually either better or worse. I would say that that has been something that has been true for, for me for my whole life. So you start out with an intention, you try to magically exceed it and are often disappointed. <laughs> Even though others may go, this is fantastic. It may not have just achieved that. Or sometimes you, you do go beyond it, but it just doesn't work for you. So um, and, I, I think intention is the foundation of the beginning of a process, not the end. And I would argue that um, with a computer, uh, the, um, the uh, infinite monkeys with typewriters finally coming up with uh, Shakespeare's works, um, that was, was probably easier to do with a computer than with Without a, without one, right? <laughs> yeah, it'd Probably certainly be a bit faster. quicker, if not easier. Yeah, definitely. The question is, who's yeah, going to look at all these pictures, so, right? So, so there's a hypothesis here, isn't it, or a, or a, a, a contention or a, a conjecture that from Chris that actually these AI tools are going to change the way that we as photographers work and change, maybe blur the edges between make and take. Maybe I mean, it's all coming. 
there is photography that will not be replaced. And we're talking, of course, documentary things and so on that uh, you, do, you don't want to generate a documentary picture. But um, a certain part of that will be more made than taken and made in a very literal sense. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think it's how you roll off the bed in the morning, like what, what, you know, what you feel like. And, and you know, for me, art is an exploration, you know, of our, it's, it, it's as much an exploration as it is uh, an expression. It ends up to be an expression, but for me, it's an exploration of how to keep seeing, how to keep thinking, how to keep imagining. And uh, one of the things about AI is it forces you to kind of really question your imagination. Like, what, what image do you have in your head? How do you translate that verbally, which is a very different way of processing information, visually and language, and language and written language, because those are very, very different too. And how that all kind of synthesized in terms of our expectations, knowing what we do about photographs. I always tried to kind of move towards a, call it a, 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 a neorealistic view of imagery rather than a render or a 3D or a car cartoon. It's just my own uh, work. Um, so if it skirts the edges of appearing to be real, and that reality for me is based on photographic aesthetic over the last 150 years, let's call it. Um, if I was into doing the same thing with AI as a painter, it would be a different kind of approach. Um, but you start to learn a language that the computer understands or seems to understand. Um, and continually refining the output based on language. And so it's that dance of written language, creative output. Now with the lens, as Chris said, cameras have their own AI, whether it's basic in terms of this is sharp, this should be sharp, this shouldn't be sharp, um, this should be bright, this should be dark. <clears throat> those, those are things that are engineered. They're not given. Um, nothing's to say that a washed out image <clears throat> in black and white of a desert with things almost invisible is not as powerful as a perfectly exposed, you know, landscape. It's just really what the camera determines is the right exposure. Can, can I jump in here? Right. I'd like to talk about tubular bells for a moment. <laughs> the album. The album Tubular Bells. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, they, those two words don't really go to other, together in any other meaningful concepts, do they? I suppose, apart, Mike? From, apart from the uh, instrument that the album in, is in music, they do. <laughs> I suppose well, in music, well, they. What do, was yeah. the composer, Mike? Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield. Um, so the reason to I don't know if either of you have ever watched uh, that there is at least one documentary about the making of Tubular Bells and it interviews Richard Branson as well and all of this uh, yeah, because the yeah, uh, Tubular Bells for those that don't know was the first album on uh, on the Virgin record label wow, and it okay. was it was a financial make or break for Richard Branson that set him on the path to becoming an astronaut so the it, the, the the thing about Tubular Bells was that Mike Oldfield w was a young lad, in incredible talent, um, and in incredible existential pain as well. And and you know he he didn't choose to write Tubular Bells. It was just you know ripping and tearing its way out of his soul. And uh, the, the, there's an interesting side story about how the Tubular Bells got onto the album as well, which I'll let you watch the documentary for that one because it is fun. Um, but the the, the the thing I can't quite process in my head at the moment is this whole sort of you know, intelligent use of AI and the, you, intelligent use of AI based tools to do planning and pre-visualization of that with that just soul and gut wrenching experience of being a creator in pain. Um, it, it's I, 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 I'm not saying that the AI thing that we've been talking is wrong and there's definitely a role for AI in both the making and probably the taking side as well. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I suppose if there's, there's anything I'm trying to say is I'm glad we live in a world where people can still express themselves and it's not just all about the tools. I don't know. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. And, and of course you put, you're, you're, you're bringing up the, the, one of those old questions. Is it, is it necessarily to, is it necessary to be in pain to be able to be creative? 
which I don't think we can answer here. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't necessarily believe that because I like to think I'm a little bit creative and my creativity doesn't particularly come from pain other than perhaps the frustration of, of not really being very good at it. <laughs> but I don't think that really counts. It's not really an existential pain. Somebody else know, wrote I, a song called Art for Art's Sake, didn't they? So <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I think the human condition is that yin and yang, that balance between pleasure and pain that, you know, that, that really drives it. Um, I think if some artists kind of lean towards uh, towards pain to kind of manifest and some towards pleasure, but we all feel both, you know, how could you not? And, and I think it's really just the fact of being human, having consciousness and some tools to express. And we're not the only ones. There are other living creatures who do express themselves. I think octopi do. I, you know, I, I, I think that there are just the nature of, I guess what what uh, the writer Celine said, just a big shout out to the universe saying, I'm here, I'm alive, you know, listen to me, please. <laughs> like, you know, I, and I think that sense of I want to feel significant some, somehow that I am not invisible um, is a basic human yearn. Hmm. Food for thought. And the question, the question of control or no control, um, I think we can wrap that into our question. What does that mean for the future of photography? I think the little, the little, uh, tiny little uh, thing that everyone can take away from that is may maybe try, try being a bit more deliberate about what you want to shoot. Try to try yeah, to, maybe, yeah. to approach it for with an a, bit, a bit more intent an as an exercise. Yeah. That's uh, something that I would suggest because because yeah, having to be more descriptive and more deliberate in uh, with a different tool now. Um, that is already influencing my photography in one way or another. It's already interesting. It's mm. already doing something. More to come on that then, certainly. And, and, oh, and by the way, sometimes one works very, very conventionally in terms of the capture, but then goes off the rails in terms of how the, you output it. Like I've just you know? been doing some, some experiments printing on metal, uh, both... Um, aluminum but with a sort of a gold or coppery finish um and i've been using again uh glass which i have in the past um white wall shout out to those guys in germany they've been so great and i've got a great relationship with them and they turn it around fast and they really understand what i'm trying to achieve i think they're the best in the world that i've found and so it, i will get a lot of color that I don't print here on paper, I will explore mediums with them. I just uh, got a few things from uh, Infinite Objects, which is they print video uh, in, in small frames. Uh, and and um, they were really very effective. And maybe at a certain point, I'll kind of show them. <laughs> as yeah, I mean, I wish you could have a conversation about that, definitely. Yeah, that's another episode is is printing video, I think, is a very interesting uh, conversation. Anyway, so, so, but, so you, you know, the output is a whole other world. Yeah, that's, that's, that's by, by the way, the reason that I've stuck with photography for so long, because it is such a vast universe of things, um, of yeah. ways to approach, of phases that, that your work goes through, and so on. It's, um, yeah. Keeps me yeah, busy. Pre Keeps me interested. You know, like we could have a very specific technical uh, conversation about pre-visualization, which is a whole other other world. In other words, building wireframes, uh, creating in, in Maya, um, choosing your camera angles, all of those things, and then dressing it up with light and, and subject. And, you know, in film, we do this for action sequences often. And then and then the second unit is basically recreate this, you know, this three second shot with the assets that we give you either digitally or in real life. Um, so pre-visualization is a way for us to not overshoot, uh, but also understand how shots come together because these things tend in film to be very expensive. Sounds like another whole show on its own. Well volunteered, Every, Jeremiah. <laughs> everyone, everyone who who came home from a vacation with uh, eight thousand pictures and having to oh, see yeah. through those <laughs> will gigabytes, probably like that, yeah. think about: Can I do this with a bit more intent and a bit less um, material in the future? Sure. 
All right, that takes us straight into our picks of the week. Let's see what have we brought. Um, let's go to Adrian. Adrian has a book recommendation. I do have a book recommendation. I, I finished. I've just finished reading this book, and it's awesome. It's called AI Twenty Forty One. And uh, for those that are interested in reading around the topic of AI a little bit, this is a fantastic primer. Um, what what it does is it sets out 10 visions written in a 10 sci-fi short stories set in the year 2041. So 20 years after it was written last year. And it then it, those have been written very specifically to explore high prob highly probable futures of how ai will interact with our world and how we will interact with ai uh, in, in 20 years from now um it's written by uh, a science fiction writer chinese science fiction writer and a long time served and very influential uh, academic and industry leader in the field of ai um, so i would very much recommend that people read that uh, if you are going to read it don't leave it five years uh, it is one of those books <laughs> that is very timely, very timely. Uh, and you know when you speculate around those sorts of things of course often the world takes a different direction because the world hasn't read the book so it doesn't know the plan uh, uh but definitely give it a read it's very very interesting and it does include things relevant to photography it includes things like computer vision and it includes things like virtual reality augmented reality mixed reality so there's a lot of stuff that we talk about that is represented in this book so go go get it ordering it immediately wonderful Bye. Um, I have brought a video which goes to the other end of the spectrum. It's the second part in a three-part series. Um, the, I think the first part was over a month ago by Smarter Every Day. And it is, um, the, the guy's name is Destin. And he uh, did a visit to Kodak and got a behind-the-scenes look at how they make film, which used to be one of the best guarded secrets in the world. And uh, he got access, so a, a month ago he did the first part where they talked about how to make the film base, the plastic that the, that the gelatin with the, the emulsion is poured on. Second part is the pouring of the emulsion, which, which is, if you watch the video, it is just amazing to see how much goes in there how difficult that is uh, the 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 one mile long drying tunnels they use where the film gets drawn through in in, in without touching anything and st it's just amazing to see um that kind of stuff and i thought i knew how film was made um and i <laughs> learned a lot of new things from there and he has the best possible access he spent several days there shooting and having uh, access to everything pretty much it's amazing it's really amazing good good second part and i can't wait for the third part so um that and the first part of it um is totally worth a watch when if if, if you're interested in looking behind the scenes of how things are made um and then last but not least we have jeremiah who brought us an artist Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say about intention? Um, a couple of things here. Uh, I've often thought about about a way to kind of give up one's connections with all of one's tchotchkes, uh, everything one owns, and how we are kind of attached to those things. Mm -hmm. And maybe by just recording them and seeing them as single objects we are able to kind of have a connection and then get rid of the object and keep the the kind of record of it but i i thought this is an amazing amazing discipline talk about going and having an intention to photograph something and yet forces you to kind of examine all of this i, I i'm i'm very impressed with this this is an amazing so she she photographed all 10,532 objects in her house. That's right. Holy cow. That's that's quite an undertaking. Um, it's quite, so it uh, reminds me of those you know, minimalism videos that you see. <laughs> it's like how to, de <laughs> how to declutter stuff. But, but even but just looking at the individual coding. images is pretty amazing. You know, a yeah. shirt, a, you know, a salt shaker. <laughs> you know, you know what that reminds me of? The, um, do, you, you very likely have heard of the Bechers 
um, a sure. couple yeah. who who collected indust photos of industrial buildings in, in everywhere on this planet, and they spent uh, decades to to travel around and and catalog uh, different categories of these buildings and objects and so on. Um, yeah. Very very, I think I think pretty much a, a, a precursor of. Sure. Of the of of that project that that you can then do at home without leaving your home. I mean that is a that's it. That's gonna but be. it forces you to examine things with a different light, and that is the beauty of photography. It, you right. know, we look at something, a leaf of uh, you know something on the ground, and it forces us to kind of have a a, a thought about it. However, right. a perspective about interesting it. interesting stuff. So before we end the episode, I have I have one more bonus thing that, that just came to mind while we were recording this. Um, to to train your intent and your descriptive abilities, um, we've talked about this in the past. It used to be called Dali Mini. It's now uh, renamed itself to Crayon. C R A I Y O N. I've uh, recreated um, Jeremiah's walks. Along the Venice channels <laughs> oh with palm trees and everything, God, just with a simple prompt. Um, that's the kind of stuff you can do with that. It's not as high quality as the actual Dali, but it is worth having a look. It's worth playing with because um, it, it'll it'll help and sharpen that that tool, that descriptive tool that will probably help you in your photography. So we're going to link that in the show notes and. Yeah, that's it. I'm going it. all in on Hanover now. <laughs> yeah, that, take take one from, send me one from outside here of the house. <laughs> no, not nothing, nothing as as descriptive as the channels though here. It's very flat countryside here with uh, lots of fields and things and some and some wind turbines. So that's enough of a hint for you. Let's see what I come up with. That's what you get. Yeah, so that's it for this episode. It was good to be back with uh, with the two of you. Um, and uh, we'll be back in a week, I guess, with something else. Something yep. else interesting. And um, until then, everyone, take care. You've been listening to The Future of Photography, Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Mm -hmm.